Okay. We'll get things going. We are so glad you're here with us tonight for another virtual conversation. I'm Karen Hansen. I work in the marketing and communication department here at Candy Canines, and I'll be presenting questions during our time tonight. Um, we're really pleased that these presentations have been so popular tonight. It's no exception, as we're expecting about 175 people. Um, so we really appreciate those of you who submitted questions ahead of time. That helps us out. We've received quite a few, so we would ask that you maybe wait a little bit uh, before submitting a question this evening. So um, the thing that might be on your mind may, in fact, be getting addressed at the beginning half of the evening here. So maybe hang hang with us and just see how that uh, plays out a little bit. But if you do have one that you do want to submit in a little while, you can do so by clicking the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen and typing in your question to send, and we'll get to as many of those as we can before 8 o'clock. If you would like to use the closed captioning feature that is available just below, click on the live transcript icon and select show subtitle. I also want to acknowledge Justine, who's here as our ASL interpreter this evening. Thank you, Justine. Um, and I just want to give a brief introduction of our two co-hosts this evening. Jeff Johnson has been our executive director for about a year and a half now, and he will share some updates and new plans that are in the works for us. One new exciting initiative is that we have begun training facility dogs and skilled home companions. Julianne Larson, our director of training, who just had her 17 year work anniversary with us this past week, uh, will provide more details about what this means for us, our dogs and our future. So to kick things off, I am going to turn it over to Jeff for some opening comments. Awesome. Thank you, Karen, for um, putting this together and being here again, and to Peter, who's also in the office tonight, and uh, Julianne for being here, and Justine again. So we, we appreciate it, and we want to thank you for joining us tonight um, and being part of this Can Do Canines team and family. Um, you know, if there are really 170 or 175 people online, even while the Timberwolves are playing, we appreciate that very much. Um, I just want to give you a, a big picture update about what has been going on here before we get more specifically into the questions you have to ask and uh, particularly about facility dogs and skilled home companions. As many of you know, last year we spent a big chunk of time working on our strategic plan, our five-year strategic plan, and we are now in just a really exciting time in the, what, 32-year history of this organization because we are done with the strategic plan. We finished it at the end of last summer, and now we are, we are actually implementing it. And just to remind you, the strategic plan had three major goals, three broad goals. Goal number one was to do better what we're already doing. So that means better serving our clients. It means better engaging and supporting our volunteers and our staff and our supporters and donors. Goal number two was to dramatically raise our profile so that many more people within Minnesota and Wisconsin know who we are and what we do and get to hear our story. And in also so doing then cast a broader net so that we are reaching into communities that traditionally we just haven't had a lot of luck with, particularly communities of color. And then goal number three is to serve more people with disabilities. And that is both in the traditional way of certifying teams, so hopefully growing over time, but also being continuing to be innovative and creative with new ways that we can serve people. And you're gonna hear in detail about two of those ways, again, facility dogs and skilled home companions when Julianne gets to talk in a couple minutes. But that was the strategic plan. And oftentimes I've been part of organizations where you spend a boatload of time on a strategic plan, and then you spend some time trying to decide how you're going to implement it. And within a year, everyone's kind of forgotten about it. And we're not going to allow that to happen. So we followed up the strategic plan with a very ambitious and very detailed work plan for Can Do Canines, for the entire organization. And then from that document, every department within Can Do Canines has created its own work plan, which is based on the bigger work plan. And then from that, every employee within Can Do Canines has a set of 
very specific goals for 2022 that arise from that strategic plan and the work plans. So the strategic plan is going to actually guide us for the next five years. And people are really excited about it because there's, I, I could share 20 different things that are happening because of it. I won't, a few of them may come up with the questions tonight. I wanna add one other thing before I turn it over to Julianne. So one thing that we intentionally left out of the strategic plan is one of the biggest questions we have here. And that is the question of growth. How big do we wanna become down the road? In the strategic plan, we addressed lots of questions about different sorts of growth. You know, one definition of growth is how well we serve our clients. And so we talked about that and how well we support our volunteers, that's growth. Um, reaching into new communities is growth. Being creative about how we serve people is growth. But the, the one question we intentionally didn't answer in that process was, the very traditional definition of growth in an organization like ours. And that's just your bottom line number. How many teams will we certify? So last year we were at 41, which was a little bit of a dip because of several issues, but especially COVID. This year we are hoping and on track to be back in the low to mid fifties, probably for the number of teams that we certify. And the question arises in three years or five years or 10 years, do we wanna be in the fifties? Do we wanna be in the sixties? Do we wanna be at 100 or 150? I mean, I think there are probably very broad opinions on that, both within the group that's on this call and within our board who will make the final decision on that. So we have formed as part of strategic planning, a work group that, is, that consists of board members and staff and volunteers and clients. And that work group over the course of the next six to eight months is gonna be meeting every month to try to define what would need to happen if the board were to decide at some point that we wanna grow in some significant way. That decision hasn't been made. So if there are those of you out here who, who don't like that idea, don't worry, we're not there yet. But there are many people who would like to see us grow in a significant way. And we wanna make sure before that decision is made that those decision makers have every piece of information possible about what would need to happen. So for example, do we even know that there's client demand within Minnesota and Wisconsin to grow to say 100 or 120? The work group's job will be to try to figure that out. Is the demand really there? Um, with respect to staff, how many more staff would we need in order to do that, to grow in that way without sacrificing quality or sacrificing uh, the, the health of our, of our own staff here? What about volunteers, for example? How many more volunteers would we need? Would we need to expand to more prisons to make this work? We know that we couldn't grow to 80 or 100 under the whelping model that we currently use. So would we need to build a whelping facility or would we need to purchase a, uh, an existing building and retrofit that to be a smaller whelping facility? So these are all questions that need to be at least defined if not answered before any big decisions can be made about growth. So stay tuned on that because I know a lot of people are asking that question, you know, how big do we want to grow, if at all, from here? And uh, towards the end of the year and certainly early next year, we're going to start, uh, we're going to be bringing up that discussion in a, a more meaningful way and you will all be part of it. So that is, that's another exciting piece of, of what's happening and that, that piece is just starting. So with that, um, Karen already made the introduction, but I'm gonna turn it over to Julianne to just give you a little bit of background on facility dogs and skilled home companions, and then Karen will jump into the questions. So Julianne. Thank you very much, Jeff. And as Jeff mentioned, I'm here to talk about these new types of placements that we are looking at um, doing this year and answer any questions about them that you may have. Um, well, Candu Canines has placed a handful of facility-based service dogs in the past, 20 years or so. Um, it has never been a formalized program. And this year we're going to change that. Um, we're currently in the process of placing our first two dogs at M Health Fairview Masonic Children's Hospital, which is a mouthful, um, in that capacity as facility based service dogs. Um, we decided to begin offering this type of placement as another avenue for our dogs to serve people in need by taking a dog that maybe wasn't quite the right fit for an individual placement in one of our current five programs um, and utilizing that dog's skills maybe in a, a different unique way. Um, the dogs that we will be placing in these 
facilities are task trained, meaning that they have specific commands for skills that they will perform to assist patients or clients in whatever setting the dog is placed in. This is very different than therapy dogs that, that you may have seen in hospitals or nursing homes or school settings. Um, therapy dogs are there to provide comfort uh, by accepting petting and attention from individuals, but they are not required to perform specific tasks. Uh, so that's how this, those are different situations, right? So the, the, it, it all comes down to task training these dogs. So the other new avenue we are looking at uh, starting this year is what's called the skilled home companion. Um, this, we're looking at another way to place a dog with someone that for a variety of reasons may not want a dog to accompany them in public. Uh, we're seeing more and more of a need for this type of placement, particularly since COVID. Um, many people that are interested in an assistance dog are just not comfortable going in public and trying to get through that training process um, going into different public spaces just isn't for them. So this is a wonderful way for us to take a dog that maybe we would have career change been released from the program due to discomfort in public settings, as an example, um, but we can still put their amazing skills to work. These dogs may perform all of the same skills that our fully certified dogs perform, but they will be expected to only perform those at home. So these dogs are different from emotional support dogs, uh, because again, they are task trained to mitigate the effects of a person's disability. Emotional support dogs are a little more like therapy dogs and they're used to provide comfort to a person but are not task trained. So just a quick overview of these two new types of dogs. And at this point, Karen, I believe you have quite a few questions. So I'd be happy to open it up for those. Great, yes, I will just pop in and voice these questions from time to time. But um, Julianne, you mentioned career change dogs as we know them. And uh, a few people have asked about that uh, in regard to this role in um, using these facility and, and home, skilled home companion dogs. Will that reduce our number of what would otherwise be career changed dogs? That is definitely one of our goals with these placements. Um, we have so many wonderful dogs that for whatever reason just aren't the right fit um, that we are hoping will fit into these models or, or these types of placements. Um, so that should reduce our number of career change dogs and, and will help give those dogs a job like they were bred to do. Great. Um, can you maybe just explain a little more to um, what the criteria usually is for a dog being career changed, just so people are aware of that and, and how many people are involved in making that decision? Sure. Um, well, it's definitely a team decision. Um, I would say at a minimum, there's three staff involved in any career change decision, usually more. Um, there's so many different reasons for career changes. So often if it's a behavioral or a temperament reason, we're going to have some of the training staff involved or the puppy program staff. I'm involved in every career change decision as well. Um, if it's a medical-based decision, then we're going to get our vet tech involved, our veterinarian involved, along with you know puppy program and, uh, and trainers, depending on what stage of training that dog happens to be in. And again, I'm always involved in those decisions too. Okay. Um, so the different paths that dogs can have, we obviously are gonna still have some that are career changed, but what makes it special for these dogs that are gonna be facility dogs or skilled home companions. Mm -hmm. What are the criteria that might set them apart to keep them in in this capacity instead um, and not, not become that career changed dog, sure. but not necessarily a, you know, our service dog in the other capacity? Yeah, sure. So facility-based service dogs, um, typically are gonna be a dog that is gonna be comfortable around a lot of different people. Um, maybe even a dog that's a little too solicitous for us, you know, just a little interested in everybody and, and a little less focused on the handler. Um, with our current placements that we do, our one-on-one -on -one placements, we want that dog really focused on his client. So a facility-based service dog is gonna be a little different in that route um, where it's gonna be soliciting attention when told to, but it's gonna be interacting with a lot of different people on a lot of different levels. Um, a skilled home companion 
basically going to have all the same skills as whatever type of placement it would have fit in, whether it's a mobility assist or a hearing assist dog. The difference there is strictly the public access piece. And, and we have plenty of dogs that over the years that just aren't comfortable, you know, and I talk to I talk to people that apply with their owner provided dogs about does your dog really want to go to the Mall of America or anything like that. So looking at dogs like that for this skilled home companion type of placement that maybe don't like public, but they love to work, you know, they want to retrieve, they want to tug the refrigerator, they just don't want to have to pick up your keys at the mall if you drop them. So that's a little bit how those dogs, what we look for in those dogs. Uh, we'll keep going with you for a little bit more, Julianne. Um, we're on a roll here, but can you tell a little more about the types of tasks specifically that the facility dogs then will perform? Sure. Um, it's going to be very unique to the setting that the dog is working in. Um, for example, at the hospital right now that we are placing the dogs in, the dogs are going to be doing some retrieving, you know, to help with OT and PT. They will do some nudging of a, a large ball to, again, during OT and PT with some, with some of the children. Our dogs will be wearing a vest, kind of like our autism assist dogs wear right now with a handle to help get some children up and walking and provide a little bit of counterbalance when needed, um, maybe post-surgery or um, other kind of treatments. Uh, they also are planning to use the dogs just in a lot of different therapeutic type ways to help get the kids comfortable. You know, say a child is there and has to have an IV put in, they'll maybe do a pretend IV with the dog and show, see, it's not so bad now, we're going to do this with you. Um, they're utilizing one of the dogs in their daily little television show that they put on at the hospital for, for children in their rooms. Um, so I think every facility will be a little bit different, um, but a lot of the skills that the dogs are learning um, to be placed in any role that we have here. So a lot of retrieves and tugs, um, things like that. All right, great. Um, we'll give you just a, a quick breather and bring Jeff in and uh, kind of bounce back and forth as we go. But um, Jeff, uh, how about related to facility dogs for you, given our current mission of being dedicated to enhancing the quality of life for people with disabilities with these mutually beneficial partnerships. Do you see that facility dogs fits into this or is there going to be a change in our mission? Sorry, I think if you look at the language of our mission very technically, uh, you could argue that facility dogs don't fit. Exactly. And um, the board is going to have to have that discussion. The board was very comfortable moving forward with facility dogs without changing the mission, but it probably is a discussion that we'll have over the course of the year to see if a change is needed. It wouldn't require a big change, um, but that's a, that's a discussion yet to come. I, I will add that we have looked at um, several other ADI, Assistance Dogs International organizations around the country, who do a lot of facility placements. And most of them, facility dogs don't technically fit within their mission either. We, our, our mission is very similar to several of those organizations. Um, so it, it, I don't think it's required that we change it, but it'll, it's a discussion we'll have. What I will add to that is, you know, prior to this, about 30% of our dogs, it's gonna differ from year to year, but say about 30% of our dogs in the past have been career changed. And a lot of those dogs have gone much of the way through the process. So we have put a, a, a great deal of effort into the dogs and then we give them away as pets. And that's not part of our mission right now either. So what, what we'd like to be able to do is take some of those dogs who still have skills and still wanna work, but can't otherwise become an assistance dog to put them to work so that they can help someone with a disability or in the case of a facility dog at a, at a children's hospital, help hundreds or maybe thousands of kids and family members over their, over their lifetime, um, as opposed to just one person. Um, so long answer to a short question, it's something that we will look at, but there's, there's no change imminent in the mission statement. All right, I do want to mention here that Xerxes and Team Orono PD support this move 
<laughs> wrote into us. Xerxes, who was career change, has been an amazing addition to our facility, says Kyle, and a wonderful addition to our tool belt. Please feel free to reach out to Kyle for input if it helps. Um, so thank you to the Orono Police Department for that positive comment. We love to hear that. Um, so Julianne, what um, what types of facilities um, are select, how do we go about selecting the facilities, I guess, or, and how long are the dogs trained before placement um, for okay. those? Sure. Um, so we are, like I said, we are, have formalized this um, this year. So we do actually have an application process like we do for any of our, our current five types of placements. So there's an application that would be filled out by, uh, with information about the facility, how they want a dog used what they you know what they anticipate using a dog for as well as applications from the handlers of the dogs so our the current model we're looking at for these placements is um, two handlers to each dog so similar to how we do our, with our inmate handlers in our prison programs um, this is a way to ensure that there's coverage you know somebody's on vacation the dog still is working, right? So the dog doesn't have to be on vacation too. Certainly can be, but doesn't have to be. Um, so a lot of our placements will be looking at that. But I think every facility is going to be a little bit different. And um, I think like we look at our client placements, we're looking at these types of placements that will individualize it. Let's see what they need. Let's help the facility and the handlers brainstorm. How else can we use a dog? You know, it may, they may have a handful of ideas and we can expand on that. Um, keeping these dogs busy and, and fulfilled in their careers. So, um, yeah, so it's the same application process and, and look at, you know, what's going to work at that facility if it's a fit for us and, and we feel like we can help. All right. You mentioned two handlers per dog. Lots mm -hmm. of people want to know more about the, the handler situation. Where then does a dog live? This is a very different scenario than our, our current model. So can you talk about that, please? Sure, yeah, so our dogs, they're not gonna live at whatever facility they work at. They will go home at night. So they have their off time, just like those of us, you go to work, you're at work, and then you go home and you get to take a break. Um, and we will look, we're kind of looking at the handlers with a primary and a secondary handler for the most part. Um, the dog will primarily live with that primary handler, um, but will then have that secondary handler be comfortable with the secondary handler and their home um, so that if the primary handler is on vacation or anything like that, that's where the dog will stay. So it continues to go to work. Um, to maintain the dog's comfort in that secondary handler's home, um, they, there will be schedules set up. So the dog maybe once a month will spend a weekend at the secondary handler's home. Did I answer the whole question there, Karen, or did I miss something? Um, no, I think... Um... There was another part of what kind of training and follow up with the facility staff do we will we be doing? Um, we will do follow up like we do for all of our teams. So with our ADI accreditation, we have certain criteria to meet um, with follow up on a minimum of an annual basis. So we will be following up with these teams just like we do all of our teams, offering support um, if the handler leaves and they have to train in a replacement handler, then we would certainly be part of that process as well. We are here for the life of the team. Okay. Uh, will the dog have public access rights with the handler taking it out in other public settings outside the facility? No, they won't. Um, access rights are for the, the person with the disability, the dog doesn't have access rights. So in these cases, since the handlers are not people with a disability and the dog is not placed with them for that purpose, they will not have full access rights. So they will have a CAPE. Um, the CAPE is, will be clearly identified that it is a facility dog um, and their access will only be at the facility where the dog is working. All right. We're going to um, pivot a little bit here and go back to Jeff. Uh, we had a couple of people ask uh, sending questions on the cost of a dog. 
we know in the past it was publicized that a dog is about 25,000. Um, more recently, that number seems to have changed. So um, we're just asking for a little understanding of what those resources are going to um, and uh, why that, that change was in order. Yeah, that's actually a great question. So the, the number we've been using for quite some time I don't know if it's been 10 or 15 years, is that it costs about $25,000 to raise and train one of our service dogs. And that is what uh, has been set to sponsor a team. So if you want to, you know, if you, if you give $3,000, you can name a puppy. If you give $25,000, you're sponsoring a team. And that arose out of the estimation that it was around $25,000 at one time to raise and train one of our dogs. That number is way outdated, but it was never changed because it's a nice round number. All of our material said it, and it was what we determined we would continue um, to use as a number to, to, to sponsor a team. We're not going to change that $25,000 to sponsor a team, but we decided that we should probably be accurate about what the actual cost is. So in the last 10 to 15 years, that cost has risen to um, I believe it was just under $45,000 last year. It might have been forty-four, six, something like that. That's going to change from year to year because we, we simply make the calculation each year based upon the non-administrative expenses. So we don't count the expenses to, to administer, but for all our program expenses and divided by the number of certified teams that we had that year. It's, it's maybe oversimplified, but that's how all ADI organizations make that measurement. Um, and we just felt it made the most sense to, rather than pretend like it's still $25,000 as it was back in 2004 or whatever year we came up with that number, to actually use the, the number that is accurate. Um, so it's, it is about $45,000. It might be a little bit higher, a little bit lower next year, but my guess is for a period of time now, it's going to be right in that range. All right, and since you're talking money, Jeff, um, <laughs> let's stay there because we know that inflation uh, is a real problem these days for many people. So how are our finances and, and our fundraising efforts going? Finances are strong. I actually just, we just had a finance committee meeting today with the finance committee of the board. And that was my report. We're in a, we're in a good spot. Our, our revenues are up, people are being, very generous. We are bringing in some new donors and trying some new things, which have been very positive. So we're, we're very thankful for that. Expenses are up too, though. They're not up as much as revenue, but, um, but they're up um, partly because of inflation, partly because of just some medical things that have happened with some dogs that were expensive. But inflation is hitting us like it is every other, you know, small to mid-sized organization. And that means that we are you know, to if, if we stay at seven or eight percent inflation, we're going to have to be pretty aggressive or continue to be pretty aggressive about fundraising and probably we'll have to to continue to be above our budget in that area. So I'll just say we are we're in a good place. Um, but everybody on this Zoom call will probably be hearing from us just as they have in the past about the need, uh, because I, I do believe that inflation is going to continue to hit us hard in the coming year or so. And um, we, we just were so thankful for how supportive you've been and, and are thankful that you will continue to be. All right, Julianne, back to you. Are the new types of dogs being trained to be facility dogs and skilled home companions from puppyhood? Or will they be raised to be service dogs, and then if they don't meet that criteria, then they'll be looked at going into one of these new roles. Yeah, all of our dogs are raised the same. So we don't look at any puppy and say it's going to be you know, a mobility assist dog or it's gonna be a diabetes assist dog. So it would be the same as for these new programs. Um, with these new programs, primarily these dogs are gonna be dogs that would have been career changed for some reason. So our plan is not to divert a dog that would have gone oh, to yeah. our five types of placements, but um, for whatever reason, if they don't work out, um, you know, and are gonna be career changed, whether it's, like I said, a little too social, um, sometimes it's, they're a little too much dog, 
for our typical client or things like that, then we would look at this other type of placement. Um, all of our dogs do go through a final training process and these dogs would be no different. So once a dog is determined it's going to be placed as say a facility-based service dog, um, the specialized training would then happen. Um, someone's asking, will we be able to get updates on the dogs, specifically those ha that have been puppy raised with the facility and home companion dogs like we do on the dogs that have graduated? Absolutely. So we'll continue to provide to our volunteers any updates that we can. Um, one of the maybe positive things about the facility-based service dogs is you'll probably see and hear more and more about or more about them than normal because there probably will be a lot of media surrounding these placements. Um, a lot of the facilities that are getting these dogs have media, you know, planned. They want they want to get the word out about these dogs and their facility and how exciting it is. So you might actually hear more. All right, um, Jeff, on that issue of communication with people, um, someone asked, is there a possibility of having one communication person designated to update volunteers on the status of dogs they have fostered, especially those dogs in final training? We appreciate the new dogs at a glance document, but it would be nice to have a point of contact rather than um, working with the training staff who we know are extremely busy. So um, is there any word on that? Yeah, so I, I actually, this is one of the questions I saw ahead of time and uh, talked to Shenna, Shenna Lemke, who is our training manager. So I'm sure most of the people on this call know of her or know her. And um, one of the goals that we have in our strategic plan is to better support and engage our volunteers. And one thing we've been hearing for a long time is, you know, can you possibly share more information with us about the dogs that we helped raise? And so there are some ideas, I think, I think that's gotten better from my understanding, but there are some ideas in the works to help with that. The, the concept of having somebody solely dedicated to that is probably not realistic from a budgetary standpoint, but as Shenna responded to me, that is part of my job description is what she said. And I am, uh, that she's very happy to answer that and and hopefully that volunteers won't feel guilty about asking for that information because they assume people are too busy. Um, they would send that request if they have a specific request about a dog to the general puppy program line that goes directly to Shenna and Shenna says she answers those questions frequently and actually enjoys that part of her job. So uh, for right now, Shenna is the person but you can send that request in just to the general line and she will, um, she'll provide that information. And again, hopefully over time, we'll be seeing more and more information just automatically shared with volunteers about the dogs that they've helped raise. All right, um, Julianne, uh, will these facility trained dogs and skilled home companions be labeled as career changed in that kind of category? Or will there be a service dog category for facility and skilled home companions? Yeah, so we would not then consider these career changed. Um, these, we end up then finding a, the right career for them. So they won't be counted as a career changed dog. So they will, as a career changed dog, they would be counted as a placement. Um, these, uh, the facility based dogs will go through graduation as well. Um, the skilled home companions, now we haven't started that program quite yet, so that's, that'll be a conversation we have to have um, because those dogs won't have access rights without you know, being invited. So they certainly could come here, but some of it too may be client dependent. If, if there's a reason they aren't going in public, they may not be comfortable attending a graduation either. So, um, but in general, they will be counted as a certified team. All right. Uh, a question was asked prior again of the process for attaining a dog. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if that's a facility type of dog or in general a service dog. So maybe sure a brief answer so, on both. Yeah. So um, we do, like I mentioned, have an application process. So for anyone interested in one of our dogs, um, they can go to our website or call in and we'll get them an application for the correct type of placement they're looking for. So if you're talking a skilled home companion, 
they would still go through the application process for for that area, whether if they're looking for a mobility assist dog, the application itself is going to be the same as a full placement. So, and then the facility dogs do have their own application process for, for any facility applying. How about if hypoallergenic dogs are needed? This person is asking about um, being related to their condition with MS, if that's possible. Yes, we do still have poodles in the program. Um, I warn everyone uh, that the wait can be long. So um, we don't have many poodles at any given time. Um, I would say career change rate for poodles is higher. Um, so maybe some of them will fit with, with the facility placement or a skilled home companion. Um, but we do, we do keep poodles in the program as much as possible to, to serve those clients with, with those kind of allergy needs. All right, um, Jeff, what is the latest information on the study being done with the University of Minnesota with the autism assist teams? Uh, oh, that's a great question. And I, I, won't, um, I won't step on, on uh, your toes on this, Karen, because I know you are actually writing a story about this, a pretty in-depth story about this for our summer newsletter. So there is news. And, uh, you know, we're, we, we've applied for another grant, by the way, to continue the work, but there has, in the last year or so, there has been more work done. So there will be a great update on that coming in, what, the next couple months, Karen? Does that sound about right? Um, I can tell you that it's going to be mid-July. Okay, so three months. <laughs> yes, you're right on. Okay. Um, Let's see what else we have for you. Um, anything new happening with our efforts on diversity and inclusion? Yes, uh, uh, actually. There's actually quite a few different things, but I will maybe just highlight a couple of the things that we're doing. Um, one of them is we, we've done some training just to, to talk about how better to communicate with each other, including people who maybe have a different background than we have. Um, and we're working with the same person to help us sort through all of our policies and procedures and applications for both clients and for volunteers and for staff to make sure that we are not, uh, we don't have anything in there that unnecessarily excludes people or makes people feel uncomfortable to uh, want to volunteer with us or, or want to be a client. We know that we do have some restrictions uh, for clients that do exclude some people based upon the you know, concerns about the health of the dog, the health and well-being of the dogs. And, and you, know, you have to be able to take care of the dog or have other people who can take care of the dog. And that does exclude people. We probably can't change those because the, the, you know, this is a, as we say, it's a mutually beneficial relationship. So the health of the dog is always gonna be paramount for us. However, we do wonder whether we might have some procedures or requirements that we could tweak or change to make to be, to be more welcoming to people who maybe we haven't been able to reach, especially in communities of color. So that's one area. And then another area that's kind of exciting right now, we are working with the YWCA of the Twin Cities uh, to, to help us both craft a message that might resonate better in communities that we haven't had a lot of luck with, and also to introduce us to people, to leaders in those communities so that they can understand what we do and what we offer, and hopefully will help us recruit more volunteers of color, more employees, more employee applicants of color, and more clients of color. And we're, we're just starting that partnership, but we're really excited about it because you know, bottom line for me with respect to these issues is I just want to cast as wide a net as we possibly can, and we want to make sure that everybody who needs a service dog or anybody who wants to volunteer with us or work with us knows about us and feels welcomed in. So um, again, there are some other things going on, but those are the two that are really front of mind right now. Ah, sorry, losing my technology here. <laughs> um, Julianne, will there be a charge for the facility or skilled home companion dogs? Um, at this point, no. Um, we are charging the $50 application fee like we charge for, for any applicant into the program. 
Um, we are really hoping that uh, building relationships with these facilities will be um, enough of a reward in a lot of different ways. One, a way to use a career change dog. Two, maybe, as I mentioned earlier, a little more publicity and things like that. Um, in the past, when we've talked to facilities about a fee, um, there's so many organizations out there doing this at no, at no cost or very low cost that it just didn't make sense um, for people to come and work with us necessarily, so. And how long would you expect a facility dog to work? What happens when they are no longer able to work? Um, you know, I would anticipate, uh, you know, a dog being able to work, you know, six to eight years in a facility. Obviously, there's a lot of variables with that, just like with all of our placements, you know, any kind of illness or injury or, or those kind of things. Um, and I would say the, with these dogs, it's going to be just like our, our client placements that we do now that when the dog needs to retire, it's an individual decision on what happens with that dog. So is one of the handlers that work with that dog, do they want to adopt the dog as, as their pet and, and keep their retired dog as a pet? Um, do they have family members that know the dog that would like to adopt the dog um, and, and give it a retirement home? So every situation is a little bit different. Um, we're always here to support uh, these facilities or our clients and uh, the dogs for the life of the dog and make sure that they, they end up in, a, in the appropriate retirement home. Um, Julianne, we'll, we'll give you one more here. Sure. Uh, normally those who are not the handler are not allowed to pet or inter interact with working dogs. Will this be confusing to how these dogs have been trained and uh, working in the facility with many people? Yeah, I mean, it, it will be a change for, for our dogs that are raised to, to not solicit attention and not you know, be pet by a lot of different people. Um, you know, one of the things that we look for with a dog to go into this kind of placement is that ability to adapt to that. And, and I will say the majority of dogs are going to have a little celebration that they get to be loved by a lot of, a lot more people. So I don't anticipate it being a, a big difficulty in the long run. Okay. Um, Jeff, last time when we had one of these virtual conversations, you mentioned a need for more client applications. Is that still a problem? I, I wouldn't say it's a problem, but it is. we, we really don't want to take our foot off the pedal on that one. So when we talked, it was, I guess, about six months ago, and we were, we were in a spot where we really needed clients. We had too many dogs that were ready to go, but not enough clients to, to pair them with mostly because of COVID. We just still had a, a lot of people who were compromised who just weren't comfortable doing the public training. And there are still some in that position. But at that time, we also really increased our efforts to recruit new clients and get the word out. And that has paid off. The, the client applications have ticked up so that we're in a good place right now. But, but I would still really encourage anybody who's listening or watching, if you know of somebody who could benefit from an assistance dog, please have them apply because our, other than our, our autism waitlist, which is still long, um, our lists, our wait lists are not terribly long. And so we, we want to keep we want to keep getting the message out there that we have dogs that can help people. So it's not a, I wouldn't say it's a problem right now, but we really are still encouraging people to apply. How about would the applicant fee ever be raised or has it, or would that be counter to casting a wider net? I don't know if it's ever been raised. I don't know if it was 20 at one point, but, uh, but it, I don't think it has been in the, in the recent past and we've never, as long as I've been here, never had any serious conversations about raising that fee. I don't think we need to. And, you know, the, the, one of the main philosophies here is that we want anybody who needs an assistance dog, we want to be able to help them get one. And I think if we increase the fee, that's, that's going to exclude even more people. One thing we have found, and I think we will also find it with facility dogs, is we don't charge a fee but people who are able to give 
who benefit from that are usually very generous to us on, uh, you know, on their own volition, not because we asked for it or required them to pay, but because these, these, again, these dogs have changed their lives and they tend to be pretty generous. Julianne, a very specific question on the facility dogs of who's responsible for the vet care. Again, this um, will vary by the facility. Uh, I talked, as we started looking at doing this, I, I reached out to several other ADI organizations that have a lot of experience with facility-based service dogs and everybody seems to do it a little bit different. Um, so kind of depending on the facility, it may be the facility itself is responsible for the cost, um, whether they have that money or they come up with it by fundraising. Um, in other situations, it would be the primary handler may be the one that is covering expenses for the dog. Jeff, unfortunately, Candy Canines has had a few valuable employees resign. Are there efforts to replace these fabulous employees? Um, yeah, well, of course there are. And, you know, as I look back, we never like to see any employee leave. As I look back on the year and four or five months that I've been here, I think we've had maybe five employees choose to leave um, because either something was going on in their life or they had a wonderful opportunity. And I don't think that's an abnormal, abnormally high number, especially today where people move jobs on a whim. I think we actually have pretty high retention here because of the mission of the organization and what a great team we have here. Um, but people are going to leave and there are going to be changes there. I'm sure there will be in the future um, because something may happen in someone's life or something, something comes along that just fits them better. And, uh, you know, of course we will work very hard to replace them. Um, we can't replace them with the same person. So it might be someone newer who is learning. Um, it might be somebody who has more experience, um, but we're, you know, we're excited. We're sad to see people leave. I can say we're excited about the people that we have brought in to, to replace anyone who has left. We've got an amazing team here. I think from top to bottom. And I think you generally see that by our retention rate being probably better than most organizations our size at this point in time where people are moving, uh, you know, left and right from job to job. Okay. We have a question going back to the cost of raising a service dog. Um, this person says, it's always worried me a bit to share the cost of raising a service dog because I thought I could put volunteers and dogs at risk of theft of the dog when they are wearing the vest. Is this an unfounded concern? I'm not sure which of you um, wants to speak to that. Well, Julianne, I don't know if that's ever been discussed before. I mean, it hasn't been since I've been here. It is a, it is a very, very common practice for assistance dog organizations to, to publish that number. In fact, I, I don't know of one that doesn't do it. Um, and it, it's a question that is frequently asked by foundations who, if we apply for money, they wanna know what the costs are to raise and train each of these dogs. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't know that any, anything has ever happened with respect to someone trying to steal a dog um, based upon them knowing that they are of significant value. Um, Julianne, I don't know, if, has it ever come up? No, it hasn't come up. And I think, you know, I mean, if you're looking at one of these dogs on the black market or something, they're, you know, they're not going to get what it costs us to, to do this, um, you know, selling a dog on the side. Um, so I think that because of that, you, you don't see as big of a problem. I know I did just hear on the news dogs being stolen and what they was out in New York or something like they got a a run of that, but it usually is the little dogs that they turn around and sell for a few thousand dollars. So, um, but at this point, it's not a, a concern that that I've heard in the industry um, that anything like that has happened. We have ten minutes left. Several questions to go, so we'll keep plugging along here up until eight o'clock. Um, Julianne, will all litters, uh, or do they already go to a whelping prison? Someone said they cared for. Iver for two weeks and was so impressed with what he already knew and his relative maturity. And uh, maybe that's attributed to those five weeks in prison. 
Yes, absolutely. We do love our weaning prisons and I think they make a, a huge difference for the volunteers that get these young puppies, um, having them started on their basic obedience and leash manners and housebreaking and crate training. So our intention is to continue those programs uh, as, as often as we can. Um, of course, COVID kind of messed that up for a little while, but we are, we do have both of our weaning prisons back up and running, which is great. Okay. Um, is there a move to these new placements? I'm thinking the facility dog placements now related, is it, is it related to the number of client application fluctuations? No. Um, the reason we seriously started looking at these other types of placements, one, you know, with, with skilled home companions is, is there, there is a need there. Um, but for, from our perspective, one of the biggest reasons to look at these placements is an opportunity to use a dog that might otherwise be career changed um, and have it go on to a career where it does make a difference. Yeah, let me just add to that because that is, that's my philosophy as well is we've, you know, if we have around 30% of our dogs career change, we're always going to have some dogs that just aren't able to work because they're not interested in working. It's not their personality and we're not going to try to force that or maybe they just have an ailment that is, is too significant for them to do anything other than be a pet. But we've found that we've got, we've got some amazing dogs who love to work and love to serve but for whatever reason, can't be an assistance dog. And so the thought was, are there ways that we could let these dogs work and still change people's lives as opposed to just becoming a pet, which is, you know, it's wonderful for them, but that's not what they really want to do. So this is, I mean, it's just such a great opportunity, both for our organization, for either some person who gets a skilled home companion or a whole bunch of people who are at a facility, and also for the dog who wants to do more in many cases than just be a pet. So that's really the driving, it's more of a philosophical way of, of answering the question, how can we serve more people with what we already have? And um, it's, I just think it's such an exciting new program, both of them are. All right, someone maybe more than commented here that it sounds like our priority for our dogs is still a person and dog team to assist someone with one of the five types of disabilities. Would you both agree that that's the case? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. Um, and so then, are there or will there be a program for patients with PTSD, perhaps? Um, at this time, we're not considering um, delving into PTSD. Um, one of the things that um, we take very seriously is, is our quality of our teams and our placements. Um, if we were going to look at PTSD, there's a lot that we'd have to get in, in place that um, at this time we're, we're just not looking to add. And Karen, this did come up during strategic planning. We talked about, you know, do we want to expand from the five disabilities that we serve, whether it's PTSD or something else? <laughs> And after a lot of, excuse me, after a lot of consideration of that, um, we decided that we should continue to focus what we already do well and, and see if there are ways we can do it even better and then serve more people um, in other ways rather than making that expansion, which would be a huge leap for us and would require some, you know, fairly significant hires as well. All right. Can you comment on how long the autism wait is currently? It is um, continuing to run, I would say, three to five years. So we are not, not seeing a decrease in that. We are um, putting some new things in place uh, that we're looking at this year, hoping to help reduce that wait list, um, whether it's more education up front so that maybe people who are on the wait list that a dog probably isn't going to be the right fit for them once they learn more about it so they would self-select off of that wait list um, or you know and things like that to try to help um, potentially looking at other programs to help families like that as well but uh, it's, it's one of our goals this year to, to reduce that wait list. How about the wait for a hypoallergenic assistance dog? 
That's a tough one to answer because it really depends. Um, it depends on what dogs we have uh, in the pipeline and, and what's what they want to do for a career. So I may have somebody waiting for a hearing dog that needs hypoallergenic dog, but the next three dogs we have in line that come in for final training don't have that talent. It's not what they want to be. Um, so it, it's really, really difficult for me to, to even give a number of how long the wait, how long of a wait it is for a hypoallergenic dog. Okay. Another possibility here of, have you ever considered training for gluten detection service dogs? We have not. Um, I've had phone calls over the years for, for different allergies. Um, it is not an area that we've discussed um, delving into. We have talked about some other type of medical alert dogs that we're considering that would be very similar to a diabetes assist dog. So um, kind of training we already do, but uh, gluten and other allergies is not something we've, we've talked about. Okay. And Jeff, one for you here. In the past, I've heard mention of a mobile veterinary unit. Is anything happening with that? So right now, um, nothing active, but Julianne and her team are actually working on putting together the, the prospectus for that. So what would it cost to purchase the unit, which we think would be around $250,000? Um, and then what would the ongoing cost be? That, that's probably a bigger consideration because we, you know, you don't want to spend $250,000 and then you can't afford to, to run the thing because we would, we'd need a full-time vet and we have a part-time contract vet now, and we would likely have to hire another vet tech in order to staff it. But the idea is really exciting. And we think that there will be some interest in funding it from both individuals and foundations, because it, it really will be a game changer, especially for our clients. And the, the way we see it working is it's, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a clinic. It's a mobile vet clinic that um, we could, we could bring around to different areas of the Twin Cities or different areas of the state or states so that our volunteers who normally would bring the dog here or to a vet can come somewhere closer. It's a benefit for them. It's a benefit for us because we get to see our dogs more often, whether they're dogs in training or dogs with clients. Um, so it's also a great benefit to the dogs, but it is, it's truly a game changer for our clients because our clients, of course, are responsible for all the, all the vet expenses once, once they have the dog. And if we could provide them those vet expenses at cost, as opposed to what you pay at a vet, it, it would be uh, just a huge, not just a convenience for them, but it would be a huge expense saving for them. So it's something we're excited about. You'll be hearing more about it in the coming months as we kind of put together that plan and proposal. And then we're really hopeful that, that someone or maybe someone's step forth to, to um, fund the, the capital expense of it. And we just have to figure out how we would fund the ongoing expenses. And there would be savings as well, because we spend a ton of money on vet services ourselves, and we could do some of those um, right on site. You know, we could have our clinic right out there in the parking lot. All right, and we are going to uh, throw one at Julianne here for skilled home companion dogs. Can you get a, give an example of a client that might get a skilled home companion dog other than not wanting to be in public? And then will the dog still perform tasks? And if so, what type of tasks? Sure, so, um, you know, we'll have to kind of see based on individuals and, and who actually fits into this kind of model for a skilled home companion. I can say I have spoke, I spoke recently to um, a client that had applied for a successor dog and just wasn't comfortable being out in public again at this point uh, with all of the COVID stuff going on. And when they heard we were gonna start offering this, they were so excited and they called to, to ask some questions about it to see if they were a fit for that. So I think that's typically gonna be the, the type of client that looks for that. Um, these clients are gonna be in one of our five categories that we already serve. So a mobility assist dog, a hearing assist dog, um, et cetera, for these kinds of placements. 
So the only difference, they'll do all the same tasks that they would, they just won't be going in public or doing those, performing those tasks in public. All right, and then I'm gonna squeeze this one in too. Of, um, if we've considered donating our dogs that are headed toward career change to other organizations that do not career change for that same reason, for instance, allergies, um, if we've spent this time and energy and money to bring the dog that far, is it possible we could continue it on that path of a career? Um, certainly, um, I will say dogs that in the past when I've reached out, especially if it's a health concern, other organizations aren't necessarily interested, um, you know, in taking that on for their placements as well. But, but I certainly have reached out to other organizations for dogs that maybe are not the best fit for us, but maybe would work for a client with PTSD or um, some other type of placement that just doesn't fit in, into one of our placements. Um, we certainly always want to look for a career for our dogs. Um, we've also worked with um, people that train detection dogs, whether it's bomb detection or drug detection, if we have a dog we think is a good fit there. So we do try to network and, and get our dogs jobs when we can. All right. And our time is up. So we thank you all for the fabulous questions tonight and for tuning in with us. We will make this available too on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, tomorrow, by the end of the day, we should have it up there. Um, I don't know, Jeff, if you had any final comments before we sign off. Nope. Just a, just a thank you to everybody both involved here, but also to all of you out there who are supporting us. We just, we so appreciate it. And we, uh, we welcome your feedback. If you have thoughts about some of the things you heard, um, Jay Johnson at can do canines.org or, or any of our general numbers that will get to me and um, we'd be happy to talk more. All right. Thank you everyone. And good night. <laughs>